In response to Laurel Thatcher Orwich's article, How Betsy Ross Became Famous, Hilary Lau considers the importance of developing and preserving the image of a female revolutionary figure. Lau challenges historians of the American Revolution to look beyond the scope of the male-dominated Atlantic world of patriotism, protests, riots, and wars, and to reach into the freedom-fighting characteristics of women of the revolution that so importantly points to the broad expanse of America's cause to liberty and independence. Therefore, deserving of such attention is Phyllis Wheatley, the first African-American poet to be published in the colonies. Phyllis was born in West Africa, but was brought to Boston on a slave ship on July 11, 1761. John Wheatley purchased this young girl, merely seven or eight years old, to be the house servant for his wife, Susanna. Susanna, a devout Christian and admirer of evangelist George Whitfield, taught Phyllis how to read and write English, skills Phyllis picked up at an impressively fast rate. Being in Boston during the riots, protests, and debates leading up to the war, this positioned Phyllis to uniquely perceive the revolution through the eyes of a female black poet, all three of which, women, blacks, and artists, are all underrepresented during this period of history. It is hard to separate Phyllis into three distinct categories, and in doing so, her person and influence would be limited and narrowly understood. Therefore, Phyllis Wheatley needs to be viewed wholly as a woman, as an African slave, and also as an American poet. Because of her race and gender, many questioned her intelligence and imagination. In 1772, she appeared before an assembly of Boston leaders, including Thomas Hutchinson and John Hancock, to validate the authorship of her poems, to which they did find enough evidence. Regarding this event, historian Peter Gallison believes that by proving herself to be a poet and garnering their attestation, she could stand for herself and for all enslaved Africans protesting slavery to a global audience. This event also proves her devotion to American rights and identity. One of her most famous poems entitled On Being Brought from Africa to America sheds light to her beliefs in natural rights and citizenship. Mary Catherine Loving notes the importance of the capitalization in the title of both Africa and America. Loving states, the poet employs a rhetoric of capitalization to position Africa and America as equal. She acknowledges certainly the influence of American culture on her African sensibility, but she also rejects the notion of American superiority over her African self. Wheatley's capitalization of Africa and America suggests both figure prominently in the protagonist's perspective and may point to the protagonist's declaration of dual citizenship. Through poetry, Phyllis pushed against the dehumanizing status of slavery. Gallison also notes that poetry gave Wheatley an outward-facing place in the world, an authorial position from which to evaluate, console, and exhort. Simultaneously, poetry offered an inward-directed medium of self-formation. Phyllis's contribution in the American Revolution is significant because her poetry became a source of sustenance, identity, and authority in a society that refused to acknowledge a slave's fundamental humanity. Phyllis Wheatley is an example that regardless of race and gender, bravery and creativity are powerful weapons that were used to fight for liberty and human rights during the American Revolution.